One, two, three, four. Good morning, New Life Norwich. We're so excited to see you here today. Can you please stand with us and worship?
church, we are so excited to be here this morning and just worshiping our King together. Um, this morning, we're going to read a verse out of Hebrews 13. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of your way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How blessed are we to serve a king that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I love that part where it says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So I can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Every time I'm tempted to get into my mind and start thinking about everything that can go wrong, everything that people are doing wrong to me and how I'm being um, kind of put into this horrible position and I'm just like, God, what are you doing? I have to stop because my mind can run with a million things that I, you know, that are happening around me. Um, but when I stop and remember who I serve, I don't have to worry about those things. Now, that doesn't mean they're not going to cause fear and anxiety sometimes in our, in our hearts, right? Um, but I know that I can turn to God. And I know that no matter what, he is not going to leave me. He is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? He knows our needs. He knows our heart. He knows our brokenness. Um, and he, he doesn't leave us in those moments. How, how blessed, how, what a blessing is that, right? That God knows who I am in my innermost parts. He knows who I am when I'm alone. And he, he doesn't turn away from me and say, oh no, I don't want you anymore because you've got all that sin. In fact, he accepts us in because of that. And he sent his son to die for me because of that. And I can't think of any other response that I can give but just praising his name. Next song we're going to sing is Same God. And it's talking about how all throughout history, God has not once failed us. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will never, ever, ever change. So let's join together in prayer before we sing. Lord God, we thank you that you do not change, Lord God. Thank you that even when I am not steady, Lord, I can count on you to be. I thank you, God, that no matter what circumstances are going on in my life, Lord, that I don't have to be afraid. Because what can man do to me? What can this world do to me, Lord God, if you don't allow it? And even the things you do allow, Lord God, I know that you have a plan and a purpose in allowing. Help us to be focused on you. Help our eyes to seek you, Lord God, and our hearts to remember how you've been faithful throughout history, Lord God. You parted the sea for the Israelites with Moses, Lord God. You helped David, a child, slay a giant, Lord God, and you led the Israelites to victory. There is nothing impossible for you. Don't let us forget that, Lord our hearts and our minds to be focused on you because that's where we want to be Lord God where we want to be in your presence allow us to be in that place Lord God don't allow our minds to get distracted because we want to be with you we love you and we thank you
have a king that is faithful through every season.
I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to the next, and they tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all that he promises and faithful in all that he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all that he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries and saves them. The Lord watches all, watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Let's join in prayer. Lord God, we thank you that you are such a faithful God, Lord God. We thank you that you are so good to us, Lord God. And we thank you that even though you are holy and perfect, Lord, that you let us into your presence. I pray that we wouldn't take this time for granted, Lord God. And that we wouldn't just think of it as another Sunday that we're coming, Lord God. But that we would feel the weight of what we're entering into, Lord. That we would respect your holiness, Lord God. you allow your mercy, Lord God, and your justice to work perfectly together, Lord. And even though this verse that we just read was in the Old Testament, Lord God, long before you even came, Jesus, you were reflected perfectly in those statements, Lord God. Your mercy and your justice and your goodness to save wretched people like us, Lord God, it's shown even there. Lord God, as we prepare for this Easter time coming soon, Lord, let us not forget who you are and who we are without you, Lord God. Without you, we are nothing. We are dust. Help us to love you and to seek you and to want to know you better. Be with us here this morning. Speak to us. Let us hear what we need to hear. In your name, amen. Good morning, New Life Norwich. We're so happy you came to join us this morning. Will you please just take a moment before you sit down and greet someone next to you? While you're finishing greeting up people around you, I'd like to take an especial mo a special moment to give an especially warm welcome to those of you who it's your first time here, first or second time. We're so excited you came to join us this morning. Um, I hope you'll find that this church um, can be a home for you because I've, um, you know, I've grown up in church, but I will tell you that this church is nothing like any other church I've ever seen. The people here are so loving and um, we just support each other, and I think that is just such a beautiful thing that God has provided in this community. I did want to take a moment, though, if this is your first time or if your, any of your information has changed, this goes for you as well. In the front, the seat backs in front of you, you'll see a card that looks like this, a little green top. It's a welcome card. You can fill that out and hand it to one of the ushers on your way out. That way we can keep in contact with you. We'd love to keep you updated with what's going on here at New Life. 
I'm sure you'll find um, all these wonderful things. Um, like we do have some exciting events coming up. I did want to just make sure we announced um, is our women's retreat that is on March 31st and April 1st. It's going to be at Moody Bible Institute downtown. I would highly encourage if you are a woman in this room anywhere from 16 to 99, come on out. It is going to be a wonderful time, men. I know you're going to be really jealous. It's okay. you got to take care of the kids. Um, but it, I would highly encourage if you can make it out, even if you can make it out for most of the time, do it. Don't let fear or um, like worries get, in, get, in, get into your mind because if you don't go, I know you'll regret it. And if you do go, I can guarantee you will feel the power of God and you will um, see changes. And I know every year, every, every time I go, God targets something new in me and it's such a blessing. Now, like I did mention, we are ha coming up on our Easter season, which is super exciting. So we have a couple big announcements. Our first announcement is April 2nd. That's a Sunday. It's going to be our Easter egg hunt and donuts out front after the service. So kids will go to their Sunday school as usual. And then after Sunday school, after church, all the kids will go out in front. There's going to be a really cool egg hunt. All the kids will have tons of fun. And there's going to be donuts for all the adults. I know we can't do the egg hunt. I'm a little mad. Um, but that's okay. We're going to have the donuts for us. Um, I would highly encourage if you have friends friends, family, invite them out. That's going to be a great day to come. The kids can go experience Sunday school. The adults can experience service. This would be a great time to invite friends and family that you've been meaning to invite. Don't be scared. Invite them out. Now, after that is going to be Good Friday. That's on April 7th. So that's our Good Friday service. It's going to be at 7.30 p.m. Come on out. It's going to be a wonderful time of just reading through the um, story of Jesus' death and resurrection. We join together in worship, we sing songs, and we just pray together. Um, it is always a really powerful service, so make sure to get that in your calendar. Don't plan anything else that day. Make sure you come on out. And then our last thing would be Easter, which is April 9th. So I know it's only a couple weeks away. Um, Easter service is our same time, 1145, but make sure you come on out early. There's going to be tons of people here. It's going to hopefully be lots of people. Um, so make sure you come on early and get your seat staked out so you're not sitting in the, sitting in the patio out there. Um, but with that being said, let's join together in prayer. Um, before we do that, there is a, um, also in the seat backs in front of you, there is a welcome, or a giving envelope. This is for if you want to give a tithing today in either a check or cash. You can give them in there. Just fill out your information um, so that we know it is coming from you. And you can hand that to one of the ushers on the way out. Now, I prefer to give my giving through online so it comes out automatically when I get my check. That way I make sure God gets my first fruits um, and it automatically comes out. You can set it to um, come out on whatever day you need it to and then it, you can set the amount that will come out. So I would highly encourage checking that out. You can go to newlifenorridge.org and you can um, find all the information on how to do that. If you have any questions, you're welcome to check in with one of the ushers. They can help you guide through that as well. So with that, let's join together in prayer. Lord God, we thank you so much that you um, are always giving to us abundantly, Lord God, more than we could ever hope or ask for, Lord God. Even in our moments where um, we might be thinking that we're lacking, Lord God, we see everything else that you've given us to, given to us, Lord God. You never leave us without. Um, and we're so grateful that we serve a God who cares enough to um, give us extras, give us money to put on our, our, our um, money to put food on our plates, Lord God, and to um, do fun things with our families, Lord God. We thank you that you are always blessing us, Lord God, and I pray that we would be generous right back to you, Lord, that we wouldn't um, put other things uh, that need to be taken care of before you, Lord God, um, because we know when we give back to you, you will bless us over and abundantly, Lord God, even more than you already give. So I just pray that we can be a generous church as we've already been, Lord God, that you would bless the offering that's coming in today, um, and that you would use it to give out to ministries that we are um, giving our tithing to, Lord God, and that you would bless the ministries that we're, our tithing is involved with. We love you and we thank you. In your name, amen. We're not going to see the scholar today. That scholar, I love that guy. He even had scholarly glasses, didn't he? Looked like a little, like, uh, what is that, Indiana Jones kind of a guy. All right, man, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, is anyone excited to be here, or am I the only one? Yeah. You know what? If you were at a championship ball game, you wouldn't be this quiet. I'm just telling you. That's a fact. So, you know what? When we're in the presence, I don't know about that worship, man. It just rocked my, rocked my heart, um, rocked me from the core. And you know what? It really should rock us all the time because of the audacity of it. It's audacity. It's scandal. 
One of my favorite songs is by Hillsong. I know that I'm not a heretic. They are, but I'm not. Um, <clears throat> and it's called The Scandal of Grace, man. If you understand grace, if you get it, it's a scandal. It would be like your son, listen, your son finding the most difficult to look at street prostitute, taking her home and say, Mom, this is the woman I'm going to marry. What would you say? Are you out of your mind? That's the love of Christ. And you know who the prostitute is, right? It's me. I don't know if you can admit it, but I can. I know who I was. I know who I am apart from Christ. You know what? That's called poorness of spirit. You want to have poorness of spirit? Guess what? No doors open to you. You have no basis. No basis for anything with Christ. Nothing. He has nothing for you, and you have nothing you want for him. Until you get it, and you only get it by grace. All right, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Leviticus, chapter 16. Leviticus is a very confusing book, very tedious and consuming you look at it and you're like, wow, what does that have to do with anything? It seems so bizarre. It seems so backward. It seems so primitive. I remember one time I was talking to a Jewish believer. He was a good guy. I loved him. His name was Evan Fader. He was genuinely saved, but he just couldn't get it. He couldn't wrap it. He was an intelligent guy, real intelligent. And because of his intelligence, sometimes that created an obstacle for him to see the fullness of grace. And he goes, he goes I think this whole blood sacrifice thing is, is a little bit primitive, don't you think? And I was like, dude, do you even get it? Do you even get it? I remember one time, I don't want to take too long, but I remember one time we used to do evangelism right by the water tower. And uh, I saw some stuff, man. I'm not kidding you, I saw demons. No joke, no joke, no joke. I saw a guy, I was talking to a Muslim dude, and this dude busted right through me, a little cat like this. And he goes, ah, rah, rah, he muttered something at me. I go, what the heck did he just say? Guy pulls up on a bike next. He goes, man, you guys are shaking demons out of this place. I looked at that guy. He was like, he had death in his eyes. I know that look because I've given it to people. And I'm telling you, I've seen stuff. And anyways, I saw this wonderful woman and her husband. They were older. They looked like, you know, just lovely people, you know, like grandparents. And I gave him this track, and the track was Jesus, but it was him torn open. And he says, all this I have done for thee. And she goes, well, wonderful. It's so nice that young people are out there and preaching Jesus Christ to the crowd. She goes, but, oh, this, this, this track is so troublesome. And I go, why? She goes, why would Jesus have to do all that for my little sins? And I literally, I was maybe one year in the faith, and I knew it. I was like, lady, I don't know how long you've been going to church, but you never got it. When you commit one sin against the holy God, it's worthy of death. Let alone the millions you commit daily. And you do, just like I do. You are guilty before a holy God. And he will hold you accountable. But you know what I also know? The rebel don't care. Until God changes your heart, the rebel, they don't care. When I was rebellious, you could tell me I was going to jail. You could tell me I was going to die. Going to jail, anything. I didn't care. I didn't care. I didn't care. I loved the streets. I loved... I loved Doing drugs, I loved dr drinking, I loved roughhousing, I loved it. You told me it was wrong, my, you're making your mother brokenhearted. I didn't care. You know when I did care? Was when I was convicted of my sin, and instead of God pointing at me and saying, what an amazing disappointment you have been to me. Him going, do you have any idea how much I've always loved you? And it made me cry like a child. And it made me cry. It still makes me cry to this day when I think of it. So let's go to that. Boy, that was like a sermon in a series. So let's go to, let's go to Leviticus chapter 16. Now, you've got to stick with me because there's a lot of details in here. But we're going to kind of try to flesh them all out. So, Father God, I just ask that you would guide us, lead us. Lord God, I pray that by your Holy Spirit you would teach us, that you would unveil the mystery of Jesus Christ before us, Lord God. I pray that you would have mercy on us. For those here who are dead in their trespasses... And there are people dead in their trespasses. They cannot see it. This is a hindrance. This is an avoidance. I could be doing anything more important than this. Lord God, I'm not pointing the finger at him. I would have been with him. I would have been the guy that says, hey, man, let's go out and get high. But Lord God, I know now. My eyes have been opened. I'm not better than anybody. We're not better than anybody. Our, our eyes have just been opened. I'm asking you to open up our eyes. Help us to see things we didn't see before, Lord God. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right, the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron who died when they approached the Lord. Well, they approached the Lord in a wrong way. They came to the Lord in a way that they thought was okay, and they learned in instant time that you can't approach the Lord the way you want. And what happened? They got killed. Well, the Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover of the ark, or else he will die. So, you know, Aaron's number two in the kingdom. You think to yourself, well, maybe that's true for some people, but not for everybody. Maybe some special people, they get to come into the presence of God. No, this is the number two guy. Moses knew he could never come into the presence. He's like, that's not my job. I'm not allowed to go in there. You know why? Because God told him face to face. He's like, your brother can come in. If you come in my presence, I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm going to kill you dead. That's Moses. He's the number one guy. So anyways, he goes on. And this is how Aaron is to enter into the sanctuary with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to put the sacred linen on in a tunic and then linen garments under next to his body. He is then to tie a linen sash around him and put upon him the linen turban. These are sacred garments. So, they, so he must be bathed himself with water before he puts them on. From the Israelite community, he will take two young male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sins an offering to make atonement for himself and his household. Then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats. One, a lot to the Lord, and the other would be the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for sin as a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as a scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord, and it will be used to make atonement by sending it back into the desert to live as a witness to God's mercy. That was added on by me. Verse 11, Aaron shall bring the bull for his own sin offering, making atonement for himself and his household. He is to slaughter the bull for his own sins. He shall take a censer full of burnt coals from the altar before the Lord with two hands of finely ground fragrant incense and take them behind the curtain. Why? He is to put them in the incense on the fire before the Lord and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover of the testimony of his will so that he will not die. So I want you to get this as you're understanding this. I know there's a lot of words. So he's allowed to go in. Aaron's allowed to go in. Only Aaron's allowed to go in. Only when God says that he can go in, right? So he's allowed to go in, but he's got to take this incense pot with this uh, incense, like two handfuls of it. That's a lot of incense, and there's a lot of smoke. Why? Because the Ark of his covenant, the, 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 what's called the mercy seat, it's two seraphim like this. That's called the mercy seat of Christ. That's where the king would sit, the heavenly king would sit, and an atonement would be made or a sacrifice pardoning the sins of all those who wanted to live in the presence of God. That's where it would be. But if you saw that, if you were brought into that presence, you were in a dangerous place. Literally, there was this dude named Uz. Uz touched the covenant one time, touched the ark, and because he touched it, he was going to fall to the ground. He was trying to do the right thing. He was struck dead of a heart attack. David was like, why did you do that? Do you know what God is saying when he did that? He's saying, I'd rather have dirt touch my covenant than your filthy hands. People don't like to hear that. People don't like, people will walk, hey, I don't think I was going to get judged. Can I tell you something? That's why people don't read the book. They don't like to read the book because it judges us. But what they don't know, what they don't know is that in this book, you not only find that God is the one who can hold us to judgment and account, but he's also the one who gives us grace. And grace is an incredible thing that overcomes even the demands of holiness, what we're going to see. So then, listen to this in verse 15. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering of the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it what he did with the young bull. He shall sprinkle on it the atonement cover and in front of all this. In this way, he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of all the people of Israel. And whatever their sins have been, he will do the same in the tent of meeting, which is among them. And in the midst of their uncleanness, because I live with them, no one is to be in that meeting from the time Aaron goes in 
to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole community of Israel. So we have two goats, right? You have a bull. You kill the bull. You burn the bull. You bring the bull. You bring it and you sacrifice it all. For what? Because he's unclean. He recognizes I'm unclean. I'm sinful. I've done the wrong things, and I've done it a lot. God, here it is. This is my sin offering. Then the two goats, he casts lots. The one goat is to be brought before the Lord and cut. All of its blood is to be poured out. The other one, then, what you do is, as that dead uh, goat is there, he would put his hand on that goat and then place it on the scapegoat. Take the scapegoat, give it to a, a member that's supposed to take it, take it out in the wilderness, and then the, the goat would go out back into the wilderness like nothing ever happened. Why? So that whenever anyone would see that goat in the wilderness, it would realize it. It lives because that other goat died. Israel was that other goat. We are Israel. We are Israel. We live not because we're good. We live in the presence of God, not because we're fantastic or we look better than anyone else. We live because another died so that we can live, right? All right, let me just give you a, just a, a brief thing about this series. It's not just a walk through the Old Testament where we look for theophanies. We told about a theophany. A theophany is a physical manifestation of Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. Nothing wrong with that. We should see Jesus. He's transcended. He's always been. He's eternal. He was with God. He was one with God. He was the one whom God the Father spoke through into all creation. Everything's about him. He's always through the Old Testament. But this isn't just that. If we're doing it for that, yes, it has a purpose. It can encourage us, but we're missing the point. What is the point? What is the point of this series? It's to see the divine drama. Jesus is a mystery. Do you know what that means? In the form of a mystery, in the biblical form, it means that Jesus was always there, always easy to see, but our eyes couldn't understand it. So God had to reveal it in segments. It's like a two-year-old. Can you explain to a two-year-old what you could explain to a 10-year-old? No, they'd never get it. Can you explain to a 10-year-old what you could explain to a 20-year-old? No. So God has to take him through this growing place. He takes them into the desert, the college of the desert. So he opens up their eyes so that they can see. And still, and still, I want you to get it. When Christ came on the scene, they didn't want it. They wanted the old, not the new. They rejected Christ. They rejected him. Not because they didn't know him, but what they did know about him is they didn't want him. So we always see Jesus walking through the desert with his people. He was always leading his people. He was the one, look at these five ways. He was, he was the one who took the rib out of Adam's side and joined Eve to her husband. I know that sounds antiquated and crazy, but can I tell you something? How does that really, you look at it, what, what's the point of that? Who cares? It was in Genesis, it's a story. Well, I'm going to tell you how it works. If I understand that it was Jesus who instituted marriage, it's for his purpose, then I won't make the mistake of thinking I got married so that my wife can make me happy. Anybody in this room do that? Oh, I bet you did. I bet a lot of people got married here because they're like, wait, 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 wait. I know I'm supposed to get married because I know that man's going to make me happy. I know that woman's going to be, you know what? I need happy. I need a family because I can't be complete if I don't have a family. You know what we're supposed to get married for? So that we could be turned into the image of Christ for the pleasure of the Lord. When I understand that, my household runs differently, man. That's how Genesis really applies to my life. Can I get an amen on that? All right, this is the second way. It was Jesus who was the physical matchmaker of husband and wife. It was Jesus who walked through the cool of the day in the garden and he searched for Adam and Eve when they were hiding in fear and shame. That's what they were doing. They were naked. They were exposed. That's a metaphor. Were they naked? Were they exposed? Yes. But they saw themselves in the real light. It's like that, that real bright white light that the sun can offer. You know, I've said this before. We have that nice soft light in our bathroom that makes us look like we have this like mellow tan. Then you go into your car and the sunlight at 7 a.m. in the morning shows you. You got these big red marks right here. You got this crazy pimple right here. You got that hair coming out the side. And you know, you know what I'm talking about. You see who you really are in your car mirror, not the house mirror. Well, that's what, that's what... <laughs> The, the purpose is they were, they, were, they were hiding in fear. They could see themselves. But what does it mean to you and me today? I'll tell you what it means to me and you today. That means even when I'm too human to reach out for Christ, he's searching for me. 
Are you sometimes too human to search for Christ? Because I am. You know what? Sometimes I could get in the midst of battle, and you know what I see? Nothing but enemies around me. I, could get, I tell you, I could, get, I could get so full of tension, so full of stress, I see everyone as a potential danger. And you know what? Strangely, my physical body follows my lead, my mental lead. I'll, I'll, hook, I'll, I'll find myself holding my knife in my hand. I'm like, Dom, what are you going to just go around slashing people? I, I don't know. Apart from grace, I, I don't know. It's amazing to me I wasn't in jail. I'm not kidding you. So I tell you this. Remember, it's Jesus who seeks them out, and he's always done it. It was Jesus who called out for them. Where are you? Was it because he didn't know where they were? No, no, no. He wanted them to investigate where they were. Where are you at? I, I'm hiding. Why are you hiding? I, I did what I shouldn't have done. Why are you hiding from me and not running to me? I don't know. I'm afraid of you. Why are you afraid of me? Did I tell you to be afraid of me? Did you not trust me? Do you not? Do you think I'm going to strike you down? You know, that's what grace does. It allows me to think, man, he comes for me when I can't come looking for him. It was Jesus who made the first sacrifice. It was him being our high priest who made the garment and covering for Adam and Eve to cover their nakedness. Their frailties and imperfections were covered by Christ. It was Jesus last week that we saw that was the foreshadow, the precursor of the Passover lamb. You've got to you gotta have biblical evidence for making statements like that. Here's our biblical evidence in Matthew chapter 26, verse 17 through 30. Jesus eating the Last Supper. What does he say to his apostles? While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. He said, take this and eat all of it, for this is my body given for you. I came for you. I lived for you. Why? Why do you eat? Sometimes pleasure, but most times we eat so that we can live. He's like, I came for you to live. And then he took the cup, rose it up, gave thanks to God, and he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. This is my blood, which was shed for the forgiveness of many. Take this, drink it, and be saved. He's letting you know every time you do it, every time you take the bread, every time you drink the drink, think of me. I'm the one who died so you could be the scapegoat. Now go live as a witness. That's what he's saying to his church, to the true Israel, over and over and over. See, it's never, ever changed. It's never changed. Jesus, seeing Jesus in the Old Testament is seeing more than the theophanies. It's seeing the gospel itself. I want you to understand that Jesus didn't come to just tell us information. He came to be for us information. He came to be the deliverer, not just tell us how he delivers us. He came to deliver his beloved. He came to get me to surrender. You understand that, right? Salvation's not about you doing, earning, Propping yourself up, getting yourself clean, it's about you giving up. That's why most people leave this service and say, no thanks. You could be a believer for 25 years and say every Sunday as you walk out the door, no thanks. Jesus came to set me freed from the bondage to self. Does anyone else feel it? Because I do. I'm still prone to want to follow my own desires, my belly, right? He came to open the eyes of, the, of those who are poor in spirit to see the emptiness of a life without God's kindness and love. He came to be our king. He came to serve us and to wash away the, sta the stains and sins from our life, those stubborn things that we want to hold on to, those little corrupted treasures. We want to keep those old idols in our homes. Why? Because they've served us so well in the past. He came to deliver us for this. He's not come to just give us a message. But here's the truth. He's always done that for Israel, the true Israel. He always came to do that. I remember one time I was at a, a, a pastor meeting, and there was a pastor there who I, uh, I like him, I, and I don't like him too much, but, but that's okay. I, I don't like a whole lot of people. I'm just telling you. I like you guys, though. Uh, and he don't, I'm going to be honest. He don't like me too much either, I think, but that's okay, too. So he was talking to me. He goes, you know, I tell, he's, I tell everybody all the time. I say to him, 
I go, the Bible is written a whole lot more than the, a whole lot longer than the book of Romans. And I thought about it for a while, and I'm like, man, that, that kind of makes sense. It doesn't make sense. But I prayed about it. I prayed about it. I'm like, something about it's kind of sticking in my craw. And as I was reading through Romans again, I realized it wasn't until the gospel, it wasn't until the epistles of Paul that I could even understand what I was reading. You could have the Old Testament. Remember what it says in 2 Corinthians. He says, to this day when the law, he's not just talking about the Ten Commandments or the 333 laws that God committed unto the people. He was talking about every word that came from his mouth. He goes, even to this day, apart from grace, there's something that blocks their eyesight. Only grace can remove that thing that separates us. I realized that until the book of Romans... I had no glasses to see. It was all blurry and unclear. See, God changes everything by grace. He's always done it, and he will always do it. Here's four ways that he do it, does it. Those who have had their eyes opened by grace see the presence of God as a treasure, not as an obstacle. There are so many people who are waiting. They're vacillating. They're saying, I don't know if I want to follow Jesus. I believe it, I guess but I feel like my life's going to be so boring. Raise your hand if that's true. You won't raise your hand because you know it's true. It's not true. He wants to adorn your life and make it beautiful. You think God is going to steal from you what is good? He's going he's to try to prohibit you from touching things you should never touch i don't know about you 56 years i could look back i could write a book of things that i touched that i should have never touched and some of those things were so freaking stinky that they're still stuck to my fingers if you know what i'm talking about they're called bad habits oh, i have a bad habit of picking up not thirteen. <laughs> jesus said man if you'd have been with me i'd have snatched that right from your hand but now i gotta fight against it every day and you know what to me it's a problem so grace allows us to see God's presence as a treasure, not as something to be hidden from or an obstacle. The law now, with eyes of grace, we see is a beautiful guide and a boundary. It's a promise. It's not a way for me to prove how worthy of God's favor I am. It's never been that. When I read the word of God, it's not for props. It's for him to adorn my life. It's for him to speak to me. And when I close that word, a strange thing happens. When he wants to speak to me when I'm driving and I don't look at the word, he still uses it. Here, I'll tell you a quick story. I was coming home. I think I've told you this before. But I was coming home in the morning. I was at uh, four, uh, 4th Reserve Drive in Harlem Avenue. And I saw the sun and I was like overwhelmed. And I'm praying, kind of casually praying. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I go, you know what, Lord God, I got to tell you, the thing I'm most thankful for is the fact that you're sometimes like a father who stops his stupid son from running into a place where he's going to dive headfirst into rocks. Does God do that for you? It's like he catches you, and you're like, hey, you're like, and you're, like you're trying to get around him, and he's like, shoo, 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 shoo. Chris, you do that with your kids all the time. What, 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 what? You're like a ninja. And I go, thank you. Thank you for doing that for me, because sometimes... I'm still like that little five-year-old kid is trying to run around Christ. And you know what he said to me? This is what he said. He goes, I'll never let you get away from me. I labored. This is the strangest answer. He says, I labored too hard for you. And I'm thinking of a verse, 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 verse. And he goes, don't you know that I sweat blood for you in the garden? If you're here today and you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, he sweat blood for you in the garden. Because he had to? Because he wanted to. And man, if you understand that, man, that's a crazy transformative truth. Sacrifice now is not a way for me to get a blessing from God. You know what sacrifice becomes? The real blessing from God. I saw it the other day. I was with my kids. And sometimes because I am, I am imperfect. Is there anyone else who's imperfect in this place? Come on, don't leave me alone. And you know what? Sometimes I've said, man, I've given enough. I've done enough. I, I gave out this much and only got this much back. And I can be a little bit, like, small-minded. Has anyone ever done that? And you know what? I saw my family. They were all together. We were laughing. We were celebrating Jack's birthday. And I thought to myself, I was sitting on the couch. I was like, what a fool would ever think that they gave too much for something like that. 
That's what real sacrifice is. It's the blessing. It's not what you get on the back end of it. We don't follow Jesus so we can get to some place that has gold streets and beautiful pearly gates. Jesus is our gift. I can have my gift now, here, every minute of every day. And usually the only thing that prevents me from it is this flesh that I'm saddled with until it dies. But I assure you, it's going to die. And then all of him will take over. See, that's the beauty of the mystery of Christ. He saves me today, yesterday, tomorrow. He always saves me. Is his sacrifice continual? Yes. Did he die today, yesterday? No, he died once for all. But that's the beauty of it. Death now, for those who have grace, is not a sad part of life, something to be feared and avoided at all costs. Death is a door that I take to be completely united with my soulmate. You have a soulmate, and it's not another human being. It's the one who made you. And he said, unless you find me, you will grope like a blind man until you find me. You know what? I'm sad, and I don't mean to be saying this as an insult. There are far too many Christians that are hanging on to their lives. I got rebuked the other day for saying I didn't want to be here anymore. I'll say it again. I don't want to be here no more. You know why? I want God to have all of me. You know what Paul said? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Too many Christians. Oh, I can't come. I might catch COVID. Give it to me so I can die. You know what? When the plague come for the Christians, they were saying, send us in. Everyone else is like, I'm running for the hills. Why? You're going to die? Yeah, because then I, I can be with my Lord. I, he goes, I got two choices. I can serve the Lord here, or I can go and be with him fulfilled and completely and satisfied in a way I've never known. He goes, but I'm pretty sure this. If God wants me to live, I'm still going to live. It's a crazy thing. There's a fearlessness by grace you have been given. You can clap. All right, so let's understand Leviticus and where we're at at the end of chapter, uh, end of the, of the book of Exodus. Don't worry, I'm not going to preach for that whole thing. But as we end the book of Exodus, we see Satan seeming to have God between a rock and a hard place. That's, what, that's where it ends in Exodus. God takes his people out, delivers them, and you find out that even though he takes his people out of Egypt... The people's hearts are still there. You know, we got to resist the urge to stay in prison. Some of us are following Christ and we're still in prison. Still in prison. We still think like prisoners, act like prisoners. Man, I don't have to hang in my cell anymore. I can get out there. You know what? I don't have to do the things that my flesh wants me to do. I don't have to pump myself up when someone disrespects me. I may choose to. But God has saved me for freedom's sake, for freedom's sake, so that why? I could be like the scapegoat, living as a witness unto Christ. So this is the hard place. This is the rock and the hard place, the conundrum. Satan thinks he's got it figured out. God's holiness, now listen to this, demands that his purposes and his expectations of life must be met. And if anyone rebels against that or usurps his authority, he must hold them to account. That is a non negotiable issue for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God God will hold all humanity to account for the sins that they've committed his holiness has an expectation for your life and the expectation could be boiled down into this that you would love him with all of your heart all of your mind all of your soul all of your strength everything within you and love your neighbor as much as you love yourself I'm in danger right now and so are you. Satan's like, you got to judge him. You know the law, you created it. But God clearly loves the man he created. So the question becomes, how can God love me, a people who is at war with him? God has chosen, this is how he, done it, how he does it. He did it in the, the way the tabernacle was built. God has chosen an epicenter of people for his love to be poured out. You know what that means? He wants his love to be poured out in his people's presence, in their lives, in a way that's intended to beautify the lives of their children. You want to follow Christ? 
Paul tells us in Romans chapter 14, he says, listen, don't think it's about how much you know. Don't think it's about how many letters you got by. Don't think it's about how many uh, times you preach before a congregation. Don't talk about your, your service, your ministry, nothing like that, because none of that matters. It's all produced by him anyways. It's all grace produced. This is the better way. This is the better way, that you would love. And then he tells us what love is. It's all about love. And you know how I love better? When I start to understand exactly how much he loves me. You know what? That's easy for women, real hard for guys. You know why? Because our dads usually were really crummy at loving us. They just didn't know how to do it. You know, when were you ever embraced by your father where he's like, You want to you love better as a man? When I speak to men, like brothers, learn how much he loves you. You know what? Then you start looking at other people and you say, man, I want to love them in that same way because you see its goodness. When you love a child correctly, guess what? They start to act correctly. If you properly lead them, they will. That's right, mom. You can hug them. You know, love your child. But remember, a mother's love is good, and I know this is going to be controversial, but a father's love, more important. We see a fatherless society, tell me I'm wrong. God clearly loves the people that he created. God has chosen an epicenter people. His love is intended to beautify the lives of his people. It's supposed to overflow to everyone around them. Now they live as a blessing and a witness to the world around them. He made that promise to Abraham. You and me, we now are the blessing of God that he promised to Abraham. Your descendants will be a blessing to the world. You're to be a blessing to the world. Why? Why? Because of what you did. No, no, no. Because of what he did. It's all because of what he did. Because of God's great and incomparable love, he chooses to dwell in Israel's presence. We are the true Israel. He lives in our camp. You know what, Emmanuel, the only thing that we celebrate at Christmas time, that was true every day of every year in the Old Testament. God always lived with his people. He's always done it. It's never been the same. It's just been revealed more clearly in Christ. It sounds great that God wants to live in our presence, but because sin is a problem, the problem is man's uh, rebellious and skewed heart provokes a potentially dangerous environment for the children of Jacob. Our sinfulness creates a hostile tension between God and his people. So what does God do? He gives specific instructions as how the tent of his presence was to be built. The parameter was to be erected, how it was to be erected, uh, directed, how the dwelling place was to be built, what the material that was to be used, how, who was allowed in, when they were allowed in, and what they could do when they were allowed in. He gave instructions for distances to maintain. So God says, listen, I'm going to live in your presence. That sounds great, right? God's going to live in your presence. Well, here's how it worked. Here's the tent of the meeting. Inside that tent, it's about, about 150 feet. Then inside was a place called the Holy of Holies. It's about 25 by 25. Nobody, nobody, I mean nobody could touch that, right? So you had tent walls everywhere. At the mouth of it, there's Aaron and there's Moses and his family and their descendants. And then there's the, uh, the Kohathites and the Gerashites and, and the other Levites. They're out there. But in between them, that holy place, there's 180 feet. There's 180 feet. Even the holiest guys in the room, they can only get 180 feet. Not even allowed to touch the sides of the tent. If anyone touched the sides of the tent, they would be killed. Dragged outside the camp and killed. And then another 180 feet, and then everybody else was there. So it's like, great, God is there. God is in our presence, but we can never see him. No, 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 I can bring my sacrifice every day. If I want to get close to God, I can bring my sacrifice to Moses and Aaron. And I go, here's my sacrifice. I sinned again. Yeah, I said bad things to my wife. I'm so angry. I'm angry at my brother. I haven't forgiven him in days, and I don't want to forgive him. Here is my offering. Can you please bring it to the Lord for me? And they'll go, okay, and they'll they'll kill the, and they'll bring it in. But guess what? You don't ever get to see God. Ever get to see him. So, It kind of leaves people, you think to yourself, well, why did God do that? I'll tell you why he did that. You know why? Because he was creating within us a longing. You know what I used to complain about all the time when I got saved? God, why would you save me and leave me here? 
I felt like this. You know, I was used to kind of living like a life that was like at war. It was weird. It was just weird. I'm a goofy guy. And I just was, I felt it was easier for me to operate seeing potential enemies first. And then if you proved yourself, I'd let you be my friend. Right? Because I didn't want to be hurt. All that desire to kind of physically tough myself, I was actually really afraid. I just didn't want to be hurt. I didn't want to be rejected. Right? And uh, it, it, it's a strange thing. I don't even remember where I was going with that, but I'm telling you, God changes everything. Grace changes everything. So I bring this offering, and I, I oh, that's right. I, I, I just got, after I got saved, I was like, God, why have you let me? Because I, I, would, get, I would get tortured. At, when I went to the city, I had this one cat who was my laborer. He's like, oh, man, you're not one of them Bible thumpers. And I remember I had a pencil in my hand. I was like, I, I, I want to stab you in your eye right now and uh and then he would watch me i kid you not watch me and i'd be praying singing because in a garbage truck's a little like torture and uh he goes to me one day this real smart aleck he goes <laughs> he goes, what are you one of those Stuart smalley guys you always got to talk to yourself i'm good enough i'm strong enough but gosh darn it people like me and i was like <sighs> and i complained to the lord i'm like why did you lead me into a battle and I can't even use my knife to defend myself? I felt like, man, I felt like, God, why would you do that? Why would you leave us here? Do you know why God left us here? Just like he was doing to Israel way back then. He wanted to create a longing for us. You know what he wanted for you and me? He wanted us to realize that this is a place of temporary residence, of temporary provision. He didn't want us to sink our roots too deep here. He didn't want us to say, boy, I love life so much, I never want it to go. He wants us to see all the good, all the... You know what else he wants us to see? All the bad. He wants us to cry about all the pain. You think God wants to remove all that from us? No, no, no. That's the beauty of life. And in all these things, he does this, and then he creates in us a longing. I long for the day when I will no longer have to fight against my broken impulses. I long for the day when I don't have that repetitive voice in my mind trying to rationalize why I'm thinking crazy. Do you have it? Because I do. I know the truth, but I know a lie. And I sometimes keep wanting to hear it. I'm like, no, no, I heard a lie. It just doesn't make sense. Lord. I can't wait until I don't hear that lie anymore. You know what? I can't wait for the day that I don't remember how somebody hurt me or disrespected me or cheated me. In heaven, you will never think that. You know what? You will experience in heaven what you were intended from the beginning of time. You were intended to feel fullness and completeness to the point that it makes you consumed. I think about heaven all the time. And you know what heaven is? I lose myself in the beauty of God's love, but I never lose my individuality. I am united with you and you and you and you. And there is a unity and a beauty there, but I'm consumed. I'm no longer looking at me. I'm marveling at all that he's done. C.S. Lewis said it this way, when the Holy Spirit and grace comes inside of you, when you've been brought into wet one mint or atonement with the Lord, you no longer look at your own beauty. You start to take your eyes off you and you look at the other masterpieces that God has created around you. You know, all, ah, man, I could go, but I won't. But man, I got to tell you, uh, for years and years, one of the biggest issues in my own home was my wife. She's just so different from me. <laughs> And I'm like, man, why can't you just be like me? And you know what? I, I know it. It would not be good. I have to marvel at who God made her. She's dollars and cents. She's order. And I'm like, man, can't we just be free flowing? <laughs> Lay off for a minute. Get your hands off the wheel for God's sake. <laughs> and she's like, no, don't you understand? You'll crash. And I'm like, man, I, it was just... What the Holy Spirit does, that beautiful thing, it allows me to take my hands off and go, man, I get her for who she is. You know what, when that happens, I, I have gone way off my topic, but I want to say this, when that happens to you, you know what happens? You can even parent differently because you and I know as parents, you want your kids to go in a specific way. And sometimes, if you're honest, you've told them to go in a way and you were wrong. 
right? Because you're like, no, no, that's the right way. That's the right way. Don't do this, do this, do this, do this. And you know what, man? You can let go. And you know what you could say? You know what, Lord? He was yours before he was mine. And you know what? I can trust you even if I think he's going down the wrong path. Man, that's why there's no panic for the believer of Jesus Christ. You know why? Because they believe in the grace of God. All right. So remember, everything was provided for God. Everything was ordered. You couldn't come close. Why? It was a constant visual reminder that God's holiness is never to be taken lightly. This is a final lesson for us. We get, we get another five minutes. I want to say this. Even as children of grace, we need to seek a greater reverence for his presence. You know what? It leaks out of me. It leaks out of us. Am I right, man? It just does. We know how beautiful he is. We know how great he is. And still we allow it to leak from our hands. And you know what? I realize now, this is it. This is the key. Every opportunity that there is given me to sit in his presence, to sit at his feet, that's what I want to do. You know what? When we pray, we got about 50 people that are here. Who comes every 50 times? Who doesn't? Who, come raise your hands. This is not a, go ahead, raise your hands. Who come here for prayer? Is that not the most powerful? I, I kid you not, if you have a choice, and I tell you this as your pastor, if you have a choice, you can only be at service on that week, one place or another, here or prayer. Choose prayer. Choose prayer. You want to see God do amazing things? Allow him to cover you with his love. Allow him to cover you with his grace. So God saves all of us by edict. It is a sovereign decree. That's a very fancy way of saying, I'm God and I can do what I want. And how does he do it? How does God save you and me? How does he bring us close when our natural instinct is to push away, when our natural instinct is to be corrupt, when our natural instinct is to say, I don't trust you? It's called vicarious substitution, just like the lamb to, or the, to the goats. The one goat is allowed to run away because the other goat had to pay the price. You know, that's the difference between us and the Catholic Church, right? See, the Catholic Church, not, not condemn them, they say that grace means that when Jesus died, he opened the door to make salvation available. But you have to keep it going. That means you have to get the sacraments, you have to go to service, you have to take communion, you have to confess your sins, and you have to do them regularly. And here's another truth. If you follow him forever, say 35, 40 years, and you can't commit a mortal sin and then walk away from that sin and get hit by a bus and die, you immediately go to hell. Did you know that? And even if you don't commit a mortal sin, you commit venial sins. You know what they say? You may have to spend about 13 million years in purgatory to be made perfect. Do you know what we believe? What was defined by Jesus Christ? Remember the last words on the cross? What did he say? It is finished. What's finished? Have you ever asked yourself, what's, what's finished? What are you talking about? It was a business term. That means debt has been paid in full. You and I owed a debt to God for everything that he intended from your life. You and I have never given him what he deserves. We've all hijacked life. Everybody thinks sin is cursing, it's sexual immorality, it, it, it's, it's unforgiveness, it's, it's just uncleanness. Those are the pimples of sin. You know what sin really is at its core? Two things, either keeping God in a box that he could be controlled or saying, no thanks, I got it from here. Do you know that even as a Christian, we can do that? God, please just stay in the box. Don't, don't go in that room over there. You know what? No, no, God, you can be in charge of this, but you're not in charge of the way I parent my kids. God, you could be in charge of this, but don't tell me to forgive that person because if you tell me to forgive that person, it's clear to me you don't know what they did. God, don't tell me how to use my money. I work for it. It's my money. See, one of the things that I see an unfortunate truth is it's that some people don't know the gospel and they worship Christ. You know how I know that? Because they don't bet properly. When you have the winning hand, you don't hold half your chips back. If you think that coming on Sunday is betting properly, it's a great place to start. 
When you know you got a hand that nobody can beat, you go all in. That's what the atonement's about. It's about him winning our sacrifice, winning our freedom by his sacrifice. It's his and his alone. And you know what happens? When you understand that, everything opens up. There's a new way to look at everything. You have a new view on things. You don't panic about these things. And even when you do, what does he do? What does he do? Because you will. He goes, Tom, where are you at? Why are you hiding from me? Lord, I, I can't take it anymore. I got bills and this thing. I got my kids going over here. And I don't even know how to handle it. I've tried to do this. They're screwing me over at my job. And I feel like doing this and that. And I'm like, he's like, why are, you, why are you hiding from me? Don't you know that I've come for you? Don't you know that I'll care for you? You know, listen, you know what I learned the other day? And this is it. This is where I'll stop. It was about overtime, man. I got 25 years. That means something when you're in a union. You know what that means? I get first call. And you know who doesn't get first call? Me. And I want to I want to go up to my general foreman and go, bam! I'm not kidding. You give him a good solid punch right in the chest. Why? I got 25 years. Stop doing this stuff to me. And you know what the Lord wants me to know? Listen, man, if I have it for you, you'll get it. And if you don't get it, you don't need it. And I want you to trust me with that. And you know what, man? I'm telling you. You and I can have a lot of money. That's what this world offers. You guys are capable people, man. You work hard. You can have the American dream. But if money, houses, if that's it, man, that's nothing. God says, I want to adorn your life with my love. I want you to reflect how much I love you. That means when you die, I want your kids to go. I know God is here because my mother or my father loved me like Jesus. Let's stand up. Man, I didn't give you half of my notes. I just preached on a different subject altogether. So let's get our minds together. There's a response here. As we're listening to this worship music as we're giving ourselves over to back to Christ as we're focusing in on him and we're thinking about the sacrifice that he made the provisions that he made it's all about him it's been from him from beginning to end Peter tells us this if you see it properly then make every effort to add to your faith why? because if you have the winning hand you don't pull back half your chips are you in a small group? Are you in a life group? Men who are in a small group. Mike, raise your hand. Men who are in a small group. You're in a small group? Go to them. Say, I want to know what it is. Meet me. Tell me. Text me. I'm giving you my number. I want to be there. It's an hour and a half. Women, raise your hand. Who's in there? Are you in a life group? Yeah, you can go. Can give it a raise. Are you in it? If you're not in it, you're holding back chips to your faith. Make every effort. Let's pray. Let's worship. Sorry, worship.
I talk, man. You ever feel unworthy in the presence of God? Anybody, raise your hand. I want to tell you a quick story. There's a guy named Zechariah. Zechariah sees a vision in heaven. There's this high priest. His name is just, uh, uh, Joshua. And Satan comes before the throne of God. Now, I want you to get this. This is happening in real time. It's Zechariah's telling. He goes, hey, this is your guy. He's the high priest, right? And God's like, yeah. And he goes, look at how filthy he is. He's not talking about his clothes. He's talking about obvious character defects and flaws. He's like, this is the guy that you're going to have working in your tent to bring you offerings? He's saying this to Jesus. It's a serious, it's a serious accusation. And what does Jesus say? Him? The Lord rebukes you. Who are you to say anything against anyone that the Lord has snatched from the fire? That's what he says. And then as he shuts them out the same, he goes, you angels, take off that guy's filthy clothes and put new clothes around him. See, Joshua, I've taken away your sins and I have made you clean. Now go and serve me. That's what we are to do. Let's pray together. But we don't pray as one, we pray as united one. Let's get our hands holding, let's cross the room, and let's pray to God. Let's ask him to do mighty and powerful things. Father God, we love you, Lord God. Let praise arise day and night and night and day. Let praises arise. Lord God, let, let the praises arise in our house. Let the praises arise in the mornings. Lord God, let the praises arise when the pressure is all around us and we feel like quitting, crying, or giving up. Instead of saying, I can't do this anymore, say, praise you, Lord. But I know this, because you provided everything that was necessary, you must provide this as well. Nobody is saved because of what they do. They live because they know that they have been saved. So I'm asking that you would replace our tears with tears of joy, our doubts with confidence, all the, the confusion and the chaos that sometimes encircles our thinking. I pray that you would give us peace, trusting that you have all things held in your